Buenas tardes, señoras y señores. La bienvenida a todo el mundo. Eh, para esta es que la, es la tercera eh, conferencia en el ciclo eh, El Museo, hoy y mañana, eh, organizada por eh, Philippe de Montebello junto con el Museo del Prado como parte de esta iniciativa eh, nueva del Museo de la Cátedra del Museo del Prado. Yo soy Gabriel Finaldi, el director adjunto de conservación eh, del museo y me toca a mí, es un placer y un privilegio presentar el conferenciante de esta tarde, que es el señor Maxwell Anderson, director del Indianapolis uh, Museum of Art uh, desde el 2006. Uh, Maxwell Anderson se forma en el Dartmouth College y en la Universidad de uh, Harvard uh, antes de pasar eh, como eh, conservador asistente en el Departamento de Arte Griego y Romano en el Metropolitan Museum of Arts en el 1981. Pues, por tanto, unos pocos años después que nuestro eh, titular de la Cátedra del Museo eh, pues, se incorpora a la dirección del Metropolitan. Eh, posteriormente, eh, pasa a la Galería de Arte de eh, Toronto, en Ontario, y sucesivamente a la dirección del Carlos Museum en la Universidad de Emory, um, Atlanta. También ha sido eh, director del Whitney Museum of American Art en su ciudad eh, natal, que es la ciudad de Nueva York, desde el 1998 hasta eh, 2003. En el uh, Indianapolis uh, Museum, uh, Maxwell Anderson ha reanudado una política de libre admisión uh, general y ha conseguido que se duplicara el número de visitantes que alcanzan casi el medio mi millón uh, al año. También ha creado un nuevo departamento de conservación dedicado a las artes de diseño. Um, pero hay unas innovaciones particulares del Museo de Indianápolis que son eh, quizás una de las razones por qué le hemos invitado esta noche para hablar del tema eh, que, eh, del que va a hablar, que es precisamente el museo y las nuevas eh, tecnologías. El IMA, el Indianapolis Museum, cuenta con una página web ganadora de premios en la que se incluye información sobre no solamente las colecciones eh, y el los horarios, que suele ser lo normal en nuestras páginas web de museo, sino eh, también sobre el equipo directivo del museo. Se facilita acceso en tiempo real a las estadísticas, a datos relacionados con sus actividades fiscales, eh, sobre las nuevas obras expuestas eh, en la colección eh, y eh, datos también sobre el consumo de energía y eh, distintas variables en lo que son las, eh, las, eh, la atmósfera interna del eh, museo, con el fin de fomentar el compromiso de nuestro conferenciante con la transparencia institucional. Recientemente, el Indianapolis Museum también ha puesto en funcionamiento artbubble.org, un portal de Internet único de vídeos en alta definición, producido por algunos de los museos de arte eh, más importantes del mundo. La conferencia que nos propone eh, esta tarde eh, se plantea cuáles son los retos del Museo de Arte en la era de la globalización, en este tiempo en que eh, se están realizando eh, grandes y rápidos cambios demográficos y también donde hay un sorprendente y rapidísimo desarrollo de la tecnología nos va a proponer unas reflexiones, desde luego, eh, innovadoras, sin duda también eh, interesantes y, diría, eh, también bastante, en algunos casos, eh, provocadoras. Eh, estamos encantados de tu presencia entre nosotros. Eh, bienvenido al Museo del Prado, eh, Mr. Maxwell Anderson. Muchísimas gracias, Daniel, eh, eh, para, para la introducción y eh, es un gran honor. Uh, perdóneme si hablo en in, inglés, eh, 
I think it's better so you can understand me. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be with you, and especially to follow in a series organized by Philippe de Montebello. Heraclitus of Ephesus said in the fifth century, you could not step twice into the same river. And with this simple aphorism, he implied that a river is a metaphor for time, and that stepping into it signifies that no moment is like the next. His comparison may be appropriately grafted onto interactive technology, which is like a river, ever-changing. The 15-year-old metaphor of the information superhighway is dated because highways, unlike rivers, have prescribed routes and can actually only accommodate so many vehicles at once. Art museums have long been at least 15, minutes, 15 years behind the inflation curve, believing that they continue to enjoy the communicative upper hand, issuing information about collections and programs for an unseen audience and not expecting to hear anything back. Regardless of how open-minded we consider ourselves to be online, we continue to operate for the most part as a one-to-many information source. Catalogs of exhibitions may cost hundreds of thousands of euros, reach a relatively small percentage of visitors, and adorn shelves and coffee tables with no means of being edited, corrected, or updated. Catalogues raisonnées of permanent collections are years in the making, capture whatever is known at the time of printing, and have even smaller sales and circulation, largely confined to libraries of universities and museums. And our online presence is still, after all these years, for the most part based on a broadcast model. We tell you what exhibitions we have on, and you review our hours and coordinates to come see us. As early as the 1990s, mid-1990s, art museums began experimenting with the World Wide Web. This is actually the very first page on the web in 1993. We began by placing hours, directions, and collection illustrations alongside text that could link to new online resources. Notwithstanding the enormous changes that have befallen interactive technology since that time, the prevailing model has remained largely one-to-many with a resistance to soliciting audience response apart from absorption of the information provided. Fifteen years later, the multitude of offerings on today's websites other than art museums is ever-changing as are expectations with regard to privacy and the right to have information tailor-made. Over the last decade, consumers worldwide have moved well beyond the premise that it's natural for highly confidential information, from credit card information to online banking to medical files, to travel in an instant across unseen digital networks. And we're now leaping into the pool of social networking, posting photographs and accounts of time spent in a forum open to anyone. With that acceptance has come a surprising willingness to discard a genetically encoded instinct that a substantial measure of privacy is essential to self-preservation. The emergence of a confessional culture over the last 15 years, most evident in the explosion of reality television shows, was, it seems clear, a direct result of the new privacy agnostic attitude spawned by internet-based communications. With personal websites, emails, and more recently, social sites like Facebook 
and Twitter, along with blogging, has come a willingness to abandon the last protective shield natural to society and the media. The growth of prurient fascination, thanks to an altogether public communicative arena, has led to graphic press revelations of politicians' indiscretions, the arrival of the predatory televised format of what had been the province of paparazzi, and the effective end of a right to privacy as it had heretofore been defined. For art museums, increased scrutiny into what had previously been preserves safe from intrusion led to, among other factors, emails from disaffected staff documenting misdeeds, which in earlier times would have gone unnoticed and unreported, contributing to the ouster of the heads of two of the largest museum complexes in America, the Smithsonian and the Getty. There's a fine line between gratuitous revelations of embarrassing facts and what has come to be known as transparency. By transparency, most intend not revelations that are by their nature problematic, but the even-handed provision of information, both flattering and not, about institutional performance. It's become a crucible in corporate life, and since the inauguration of President Obama, of the American presidency. Art museums that have begun to embrace transparency on their websites, like the Getty Museum here, with the numbers of visitors recorded on their webpage, and like the museum which I direct, have witnessed a surprising outpouring of curiosity and admiration. But surely, organizational openness should intuitively be the rule for nonprofit educational institutions that have little to gain from organizational secrecy. This evening's talk focuses on how transparency through technology is not simply an option that museums could pursue, but that it's the natural extension of an embrace of the internet, which is becoming the defining communicative medium of society in general, and thus, by definition, museums as well. Replacing print publications, paper-based press releases, and the unrecorded spoken word. Unless an announcement, speech, or lecture is videotaped, transcribed, and provided as a fully searchable resource on the internet, it will soon be considered a missed opportunity to reach untold millions who will otherwise never benefit from it. But beyond the simple matter of transparency, which is just the way we must all learn to comport ourselves, we will consider tonight some of the many ways in which museums will be transformed by changes in demographics that in turn fuel a need for new ways of using new technologies. The embrace of technological advances is not an end in itself, just a means to an end. That end is surely transparency, the clear and compelling revelation of a museum's mission, what it does, whom it seeks to serve, how to meet their needs, and how well it is performing in pursuit of that mission. The first fear that museums, particularly art museums, have to conquer is the assumption that by becoming open and accepting of commentary from without, museums will cede their authority to a plebiscite, deciding for administrators what information is accurate and relevant like a pop idol contest. While the fear is not completely without merit, it has to be put into a context. The provision of one-to-many communication with no outlet for public commentary or participation 
is becoming a guarantee of irrelevancy to a younger audience. Younger people, those texting on many of the 2.2 billion cell phones in circulation, have no patience for the official word of an entity if an alternative electronic source exists with a livelier, less formal tone and an invitational spirit. There are well over 135 million blogs on the web, read by some three quarters of active internet users. The reason that blogs have exploded onto the scene is simple. We would all rather read the juicy, unvarnished, unguarded accounts than the careful public relations speak of the authority figure, whether a government official, corporate leader, or museum director. With more than one trillion unique web addresses on the internet today, it is getting more crowded and less possible to stand out in the crowd. Instead of vetoing a many-to-many -many model, several museums from the Tate in London to the Brooklyn Museum have accordingly embraced the idea of blogging and have yielded to their staffs the right to post commentary about the museums they work for. The result? There is significantly increased online interest in the museums that do so. Those museums have chosen to lower or eliminate barriers to understanding their mandate and priorities by soliciting comments from stakeholders ranging from those supporting institutions financially to those making the decision to visit. The notion of inviting staff members to offer informal commentaries on a museum's activities may feel out of step in Spain, a country in some ways more formal than others that have embraced this approach from Australia to the Netherlands to the United Kingdom and the United States. After all, safeguarding the world's treasures is, in the eyes of many museum professionals, complete as an end in itself and needs no introduction or explanation. We recognize the intrinsic importance of great works of art in our care and are resentful, or at least dismissive, when others question the value of what we do. On top of that mindset, we've devoted enormous energy to revealing our scholarly acumen for the benefit of what we generically call the public, and on some level assume that everyone should be grateful that such complex enterprises as major art museums manage to publish extensive and authoritative monographs and publications that share the knowledge of our curators. But knowing who our potential public is should be towards the top of our agenda, no less than researching the works in our care. Because if we're oblivious to who is and who is not visiting us, we risk becoming incrementally irrelevant to their lives. Non-visitors range from contributors to voters to opponents of public support. Social computing, like this blog, affords art museums a dramatically different proposition learning who our public is one person at a time, and then re-aggregating these thousands or millions of individuals into groups through social networking sites like today's Facebook and Twitter or tomorrow's yet-to-be-invented solutions. The power of this opportunity cannot be underestimated. While two to three years ago, we might have relied on individuals to decide on their own to review our websites, collections, and the information we promulgate online. We're now able to make an individuated case for ourselves on the handhelds, laptops, 
and desktops of millions of people prone to frequent and support art museums. Social networking, in other words, can take us a long way to learning who we could be serving and what they need, in addition to those who already visit us. And since the vast majority of the world's population is made up of non-visitors, we would do well to learn how a next generation steeped in interactive communications will be making choices of how to spend their leisure time, both in our galleries and in our electronic embrace. While we took for granted a generation ago that caring for the world's art treasures should be a sufficient explanation of why we deserve subsidies, admiration, and crowds, it's no longer possible to rest on those laurels. The rapid pace of change has made what was imponderable into reality. In Italy, the Berlusconi government has pressed a new agenda that is putting fresh emphasis on the financial self-sufficiency of museums and less emphasis on state funding. The French government started down this road some years ago by allowing the national museums to keep admissions income, provided that they watch state support diminish over time. All over the world, museums are being asked to justify our considerable expense, expense that derives from the enormous scholarly apparatus that we bear, from the number of specialists who care for our collections, including curators, conservators, registrars, educators, and guards, to costly climate control systems, to the cost of serving millions of visitors in highly specialized facilities focused on preserving and protecting priceless works of art. It's no longer viewed as sufficient by many policymakers that we care for the material evidence of past creativity. That is seen in a global economy beset by life and death issues as a desirable feature of the reputation of a city, a region, or a nation, but is under assault as a necessary feature supported by the public purse. When governments, corporations, and individuals face ever more difficult choices about where shrinking resources should go, museums are moving down the priority list after feeding people, housing them, employing them, and giving them access to creature comforts expected by the middle class. And there are a lot more people on the way to the middle class. The world's population grows by 80 million people a year which means that four years from tonight, we'll have as many one-day-old to four-year-olds as the entire U.S. population today. The world had five billion people in 1988 and six billion people in 2000. Has the Prado's attendance grown in step with the expansion of the world's population? Has it grown, in other words, not just in the percentage of the world population, but also in drawing from the diverse ethnic makeup of the world population. If not, we should all be careful about relying on a blunt measurement of how many millions of visitors we have as a demonstration of our value to society at large. With 6.8 billion people on Earth, an annual attendance of United States visitors and international tourists at U.S. art museums totaling some 38 million people, a case could be made by a cold-hearted bureaucrat that American museums apparently matter only to a minuscule part of our potential international audience. In fact, of the 38 million visitors, a majority are repeat customers, often multiple times, so that we may actually only be speaking about some 10 million individuals, a negligible percentage of the population, who go repeatedly to American art museums. When stacked up against the other 99% of the world's needs for sustainable food supply, housing, public transportation, and telecommunications for everyone, we suddenly look like a modest proposition by the numbers alone. 
This is hardly a recipe for global relevance. Unless our audiences are growing in step with the world population, we are by definition shrinking in relative importance. While everyone cares about health care, consumer goods, having housing, a car, a cell phone, the exploding population worldwide has yet to make a commitment to the West's definition of cultural heritage as critical to its agenda. Here's a provocative way of framing the problem. What solutions for the world's pressing problems do masterworks of European painting provide? for the teeming masses that were once an underclass and that are rapidly becoming our economic equals, rivals, and even betters? Is the scarcity and age of what we curate enough to justify our enormous budgets? How can we make what we believe to be intrinsically valuable become extrinsically valuable to billions of people who are going to have a louder and louder voice in determining the priorities for public investment and consumer choice. <clears throat> Many of you are doubtless bristling at the suggestion that what was assumed until now should not simply be assumed in the years to come, regardless of rapid demographic and economic change. But history teaches us to be careful about such assumptions. After all, how long has the business model of public art museums been around in human history? We've survived and flourished since the founding of the Musée du Louvre some two centuries ago, but that's no guarantee that we will for centuries to come survive and flourish if we don't adapt to changing times. Interactive communication offers the only scalable platform to make a case for relevance about what we collect and preserve. I doubt that the Prado would seek to welcome multiples of the number of visitors it today enjoys, any more than the Metropolitan Museum wishes that its five million visitors could grow to 10 million visitors annually. That would be a recipe for shared discomfort, new hazards for our collections, astronomically higher operating costs, and statistically minor advancement of the educational mandate of our museums. By contrast, social computing offers the means by which art museums in their collections and programs can become accessible on a scale that matters, and thus by which art museums can seek to explain ourselves to an increasingly complicated world with shrinking patience for nuance. But museums have been slower to adapt to changing times than have been our traditional peers, libraries. Librarians have been coping with the digital revolution since its inception. Even as they care for irreplaceable manuscripts, no different from irreplaceable artworks in our care. By admitting that print publications have a rocky future, refocusing their efforts on building shared databases which privilege access, putting their collections online in searchable context, and spawning deeper relationships with school systems and universities, libraries have managed to retain public funding, private philanthropy, and a seat at the table when scarce resources are handed out. That said, they, like museums, have not yet reinvented their online identity to make themselves more relevant to the daily lives of online audiences. By contrast, we art museums have done little differently with regard to the provision and solicitation of information apart from offering dressed up online equivalents of the brochure you can pick up at the information desk. We have adapted slowly to our mounting disadvantage. Just think of where the world was 15 years ago. The internet was only beginning to be understood. Newspapers were the main means of communicating. Concern for the environment 
was the province of environmentalists, not the general public. The global economy was resistant to sudden change. China was growing but was considered a closed third world regime. The news of the spread of disease, like today's swine flu, could not be communicated so rapidly through electronic means. What's changed in 15 years? Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses announced this month that they are beginning to phase out printed catalogs in favor of online resources. Major newspapers are closing every month in the United States. The environmental agenda has become central to public policy, consumer choice, and corporate strategy. The global economy is a topic of minute-by-minute -minute concerns evident on handheld devices 24 hours a day worldwide. China is fast becoming a power of almost incalculable size with a projected 100 million middle-class tourists heading for Europe's capitals in the next couple of years. How many staff members fluent in Mandarin are ready at the entrances of our museums? With 2.2 billion cell phones in the world, these devices have altered human behavior in unexpected ways. Smartphones can now send and receive information in quantities that were unthinkable just two years ago. The computing power of a single smartphone is substantially more than that of a desktop computer from just a few years ago. Today, there are 1.6 billion internet users in the world. This mass of consumers will grow in the next two to three years as more people will access the internet by means of portable devices than by desktops and laptops. Is your museum website optimized for access on handheld devices or just for energy draining large screen monitors that will become scarcer with time? Laptops are inherently inferior to cell phones because of battery life alone. The typical cell phone is being charged with a hand crank in Africa today. It can rely on cell phone towers instead of complex servers and routing infrastructure. And it's always in the palm of your hand or your pocket or purse, not languishing on a desk or in a briefcase. The issue for the Prado and for all art museums in the world is, in other words, not what to put up on the web. It's how to stay relevant in a world that's changing so fast, we can't predict what will be unfolding within one or two years. If some of the, challenges, if some of the changes mentioned above have befallen us in just the last 15 years, what will our world be like 15 years from now, and how should we be preparing for it? Before we get there, reflect on what's changed in the last 15 months, or 15 days. It was revealed this month that YouTube, the darling of technological revolutions of last year, lost almost half a billion dollars for Google. <laughs> so don't expect it to be around from now, a year from now as a free resource. More important than last year's evaporating masterstroke of technological novelty, here's the central question. For a generation raised with portable digital devices as their birthright, how important will the physical evidence of the past be? How can we adapt not just our offerings for the public as we prepare for a new Gulf States region that may challenge the tourism business assumptions of Europeans? If most of the world's population, based in China and India, lives closer to Abu Dhabi, shown here, than to Europe, let alone to the United States, how are we going to compete in providing cultural offerings that remain towards the top of global cultural concerns? If you find the question ridiculous, consider this. With an emergent middle class in Asia, 
where 60% of the world lives, and with declining birth rates in Europe, along with increasing immigration, what guarantees do we have that our collections and museums will be of perceived importance to a new wave of population that will be displacing the largely Euro-American audience of today? How can we guard ourselves from becoming curiosities that can be as easily overlooked as considered at the core of human civilization? Here you have the Guggenheim in Abu Dhabi, the Louvre, and the museum that uh, Zaha Hadid is building. We risk, in other words, becoming the equivalent of medieval scriptoria, walled fortresses for intellectual inquiry of minimal interest to the world beyond. As major museums from the Louvre and Pompidou to the Guggenheim line up to send treasures to the UAE, how long will it be before the temptations of cash keep other museums from moving our greatest artworks to the highest bidders? Suppose we are fortunate enough in Europe and the United States to be the beneficiaries of the new global tourism. A recent estimate quantifies the value of the Indian tourism business at $42.8 billion annually by 2017 from the present level of $27 billion. There are forecasted to be 16 million Indian tourists in 2011, which is about half of the market for tourism in New York City. How profoundly will our museums need to be reshaped to cope with the rising middle classes of Asia? And how can technology help us prepare for the legions of new visitors from cultures with minimal exposure to our museums and their holdings? Of course, the picture could change in one spin of the globe. Recurring revelations of torture and human rights violations in the UAE may make cultural partners rethink their alliance with leaders in the fossil fuel economy. Alternatively, Western ingenuity might lead to a sudden and unexpected breakthrough that will render oil-based energy a thing of the past, thereby upsetting the world economic order once again. But don't hold your breath. With more PhDs being trained in India and China than in the US and Europe, it's more likely that such a breakthrough will happen in Asia, leaving Europe and the US seeking energy solutions from our former colonies. Let's agree we don't have to face these imponderable issues today, but let's also agree to consider what we can do to prevent the world's great collections from seeming less relevant to the majority of the world's population, a majority that is increasing the source and the destination of wealth. When Twitter appeared on the internet landscape in 2006, little thought was given to a seemingly innocuous application limiting communication to 140 characters. After all, the promise of the internet had been until that point, the limitless potential of prose and images unencumbered by print runs. Yet, in 2008 and 2009, Twitter has become the latest fad in communications, privileging pithiness and brevity over elegance and thoroughness. Its widespread adoption will likely be followed by its disappearance from the lexicon but not without recalling Lord Polonius's phrase in Hamlet that brevity is the soul of wit. If nothing else, Twitter has demonstrated that the next innovation may fly in the face of conventional wisdom. A further extension of the confessional culture of our time, Twitter offers one approach for institutions soliciting increased public support to galvanize mass participation one individual at a time. The success of the application further erodes any faith that might otherwise be placed in the sustainability of a central message, whether from a museum, a for-profit concern, or pop phenomenon. There can no longer be a central message, only a string of messages to greater and lesser degrees of interest 
to an ever-expanding and less patient public. Art museums have devoted most of our attention to text and images in devising and serving up new content on the internet. Museum Facebook pages are largely comprised of collection images and written commentaries. But with the advent of high definition video on a massive scale, this is Art Babel launched a few months ago, the text image paradigm will come to be seen as simply one modest step beyond the invention of the printing press. It's multimedia, interactivity, and easy retrieval of information that stand to put text and images to work in service of a museum's mission. The viewer's ability to navigate, participate, and annotate will be the drivers of user traffic and the museum's perceived relevance to the life of a given individual. The baseline for the online offerings of art museums includes illustrated collections management tools, like this one from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, from databases to digital asset management software. These are the building blocks for collections research and experience online, and they help ensure that a structured experience of a museum's holdings is possible let alone an enhanced navigation with multimedia and interactivity. But many museums are stuck by the perceived necessity for data cleanup, a totem to be worshipped for its apotropaic qualities, staving off ignorance, falsehoods, and sloppy record keeping. The problem is that perfection is a dying standard. The Heraclitan fluidity of information exchange makes rolling editing a more rational approach. By acknowledging that data is inherently incomplete, biased, or inaccurate, museum leadership can inform the staff responsible for mounting collections information online that they needn't live in mortal terror of mistakes. Mistakes there will be a plenty. The question within our control is, who is to address each instance of outdated, inaccurate, or missing data, and by when? And then we need to devote time and resources to agreeing on the best shared methods for data storage, data management, and information retrieval. The best solution to the problems facing constipated collections management content is to give permission for errors and proceed from the release of compromised data to its wholesale adoption by individuals in the online community. Print publications are endangered a scant 600 years after they began. For those of us raised in a generation before handheld computers, the seduction of flat screen or portable computing technology is unpersuasive. The debut this year of the Kindle 2, manufactured by Amazon, was prematurely heralded by some as the end of the book. Instead, like so many other devices snapped up by early adopters, it is more reasonably seen as an accretive device added to the cell phone, which offers more choices to a discerning consumer. That said, Intellectually rich discourse began at least in the Bronze Age, and we managed to survive just fine for some 3,000 years without printing, as we are likely to for the next few thousand years, after a half-millennium interim step of the ecologically profligate printing press. It is not text, but the moving image and voice that are the next frontier in communications, coupled with search capacity and interactivity. With voice, tech, voice recognition technology improving year by year, the keyboard will ultimately go the way of the typewriter. And what we take for granted today will be a quaint reminder 
of times past within our lives. For those who will lament the end of printing, consider the immobility and inflexibility of printed catalogues raisonnés that cannot be updated, augmented, excerpted, adapted, or redacted. It makes no more sense to confine the written word to paper than to limit the spoken word to prepared lectures like this one, while foreclosing the far richer preserve of seminars, conversations, debates, and the like. The impact of social computing on what museums do will not be limited to how we communicate and how we memorialize the results of scholarly research. The special exhibition is a cost-intensive exercise, originally justified because it gave access to objects otherwise unavailable. Jet travel has revolutionized cultural tourism, reducing the rationale for major traveling exhibitions, since cultural treasures are notionally available for the cost of an easy jet fare to a faraway place where we can have the opportunity to see them in a context more often connected with their artistic intention than in the sanitized simulacrum of an exhibition space in a faraway capital. <clears throat> Along with mounting costs, creating a disincentive to transport great treasures over long distances, loans of artworks are being monetized and access is being limited by the museums themselves. Some institutions are suggesting that one has to pay to play. The leaders of two French national museums recently questioned why admissions income collected for exhibitions with artworks borrowed from their permanent collections shouldn't be shared with the lenders. And the era of high-priced exhibition rental fees began some years ago in the for-profit space, but are now routine among leading art museums prepared to lend to mid-sized museums with marginal collections. By virtue of audience mobility, rising costs, a questionable business model, and a shrinking supply of readily available artworks, major special exhibitions are facing an uncertain future. An institution of no less scale than the Metropolitan Museum has joined the Art Institute of Chicago in saying that it forecasts a significant reduction in the number of large-scale special exhibitions in the years ahead. The implication is that if you would like to see their treasures, you need either head for their cities or be prepared to spend significant ticket prices to see their works lent elsewhere. But even high ticket prices are no guaranteed defense against shortfalls in revenue with underperforming exhibitions, which may further depress the market for large shows in the future. For these reasons, remote electronic encounters with artworks are fast becoming a necessity. Objections to this abound. While the Kindle, too, may make a book accessible after a few seconds of downloading, there is still a dearth of satisfaction to be had from seeing reproductions of artworks on a screen. But what has not been forecasted is how many of the 6.7 billion people who will never see a particular collection or exhibition might choose to have even a compromised digital equivalent of an artwork. The advent of recorded music did not reduce the value or demand of live music. They coexist happily and with reciprocal benefit. The same will be true of art displays versus art reproductions. But it's also the case that while the human eye shows few signs of evolving into an instrument with improved acuity 
in the next decade. The quality of projected and displayed images will soon surpass our ability to detect the differences between the real and the reproduced, as we've seen from Google Prado. Thus, we have to reframe the argument. The real issue is fast becoming not what the eye can see in front of an original. As I wrote many years ago, the Mona Lisa is better seen on a computer monitor in Iowa than standing before the dimly lit original sheathed behind bulletproof ultraviolet filtered glass well behind a stanchion. The real allure for the privileged few is being in the presence of an object and thus being bathed in its aura. This argument was persuasively formulated in 1988 in Stephen Greenblatt's essay, Resonance and Wonder. However, there's one key difficulty with the argument that we lose access to an original's aura when viewing a digital reproduction. The average museum goer spends an average of only three seconds in front of a work of art, according to the American Association of Museums. Three seconds may be enough to sample a Madeleine and have a resulting Proustian flood of memories, but it is hardly enough to apprehend what makes an original artwork superior to a digital reproduction, especially when the reproduction becomes incrementally less distinguishable from the original. So there's a willful suspension of reason in arguing that for the vast majority of museum goers, non-experts, a high resolution image of a work of art cannot in some way substitute for the three second glance. And behind this explanation must be a fear that artworks will be made less significant by the promulgation of digital images, which is impossible. The opposite is by definition true. The more an artwork is reproduced, the more the original is coveted. The original replica debate is being further muddied as artists of the last generation have strayed from making collectible objects and have embraced making uncollectible art installations or experiences, often rooted in photographic, projected, or variable media. On the one hand, it's threatening to see the diminution in the number of artistic creations that involve the human hand and the perceived rarity of single artifacts as opposed to infinitely reproducible multimedia-based artworks like this Bill Viola. On the other hand, this new development should recall for all of us that the experience of an artwork in a museum is a highly compromised experience from the outset. Artworks from remote antiquity up until the 19th century were not separated from the experience of daily life and displayed in isolation. In fact, the single artwork was rarely single, but instead part of a larger public, religious, or domestic context. Propagandistic portraiture was made for public monuments. Objects of veneration filled naves in cathedrals and temples and mosques. Opulent furnishings were found throughout the walls, floors, and cabinetry of palaces. And portable jewelry dazzled the eyes of all within reach. And in more cases than not, creativity was not limited to the fabrication of a single object of value that was destined for the market or the exhibition wall. Instead, objects formed ensemble in public and private contexts. Such artistic settings cannot be replicated in exhibitions or even in permanent collections in ways faithful to their original intent or original impact. But multimedia can provide an emulation of that context 
through high definition visits, the ability to zoom in and around spaces, and to compare one setting with another from far away. The fragrance-free refrigerated art museum is a poor substitute for the traditional experience of art over 5,000 years, which was in service of religion, politics, commemoration, and glory, and was not purely a delectable morsel for the eye, captured and pinioned to the wall or a trophy case is of experiencing art, such as in the less marketing intensive zones of permanent collections, which are as a result often empty. If scholarship is truly the key motivation for exhibitions, as we claim, a case could be made to buy airline tickets for professors and curators to study works in permanent collections and support their research by dispatching those curators from museum to museum, instead of by staging multi-million dollar spectacles. After all, high resolution electronic publishing can bring artworks together in high definition and with animation and moving images. The rationale of moving objects across vast distances to be side by side for the delight of non-specialist audiences is increasingly compromised. We haven't had time this evening to note many other opportunities presented by new technology in museums. Technological innovation has promise in many new areas of our museums, far from the galleries visible to the public. Registrars, for example, have long sought to streamline the documentation of collections, both static and in transit. One opportunity awaiting us is the barcoding of works of art in a standardized format to allow for their tracking and the automation of record keeping. A simple enough innovation in grocery stores, it could lead to improved inventory management and security. And by publishing the movement of works of art, as we do in Indianapolis, we can better make the case to the public that no permanent collection is truly permanent. Here are the number of works of art freshly on view this month in Indianapolis. Here are the number of works currently out on loan. Not exactly permanent. From loans to conservation treatment to new acquisitions, our so-called permanent galleries are constantly changing. And we can do a better job of enticing our restless potential visitors to return to galleries that have new works on view every month. The metrics of art museum performance are at best poorly understood and at worst made up. New technologies are essential in tracking and reporting the performance of art museums. And I've written and spoken extensively about these issues elsewhere, which will be touched on during the masterclass tomorrow. But what we can and should do in art museums, as emphasized at the outset of this talk, is to favor transparency over opacity and use new technologies to hold ourselves accountable in the pursuit of better service to the public. By counting and making statistics available for our funders and our audiences, we stand a better chance of retaining the loyalty of patrons today and of encouraging the support and participation of patrons tomorrow. Here's our museum in Indianapolis down here, and this is the grounds of the museum, which is 152 acres of grounds. Having subjected you to a lengthy forecast of how innovations in technology can help spare us from mounting irrelevancy, I'd like to close by thanking Philippe de Montebello for the invitation to participate in this noteworthy course to thank the Prado for so graciously hosting me, and you for your considerate attention. I believe that 
art museums can have a brighter future by inviting more people to learn about us as we continue to learn about our collections and our mandate. And I construe this course to be a worthwhile step in encouraging that voyage of discovery. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs>